you crack out of your egg and immediately half your siblings are gone. A transparent blob the size of a beach ball drifts through the water. A tenophore. Its sticky tentacles wrap around your sister's egg and pull her inside. She dissolves. Around you, 500 eggs hatch together. You're smaller than a grain of rice. Your mother released you into open ocean and swam away. You're completely alone. The tenophore keeps hunting. Its tentacles sweep through the egg cluster. Ten siblings vanish. Twenty. Your brothers and sisters just disappear into that transparent body. An arrow worm shoots from the darkness and grabs your brother. Tears him in half. His body splits apart and drifts away. You try to swim. Something's wrong. You push your fins as hard as you can and barely move. The water feels thick. Wrong. A baby anchovy appears and swallows 15 of your siblings in two gulps. They don't even try to run. Most remoras die in the first week, but what finally kills this one will shock you. You're surrounded by food you literally cannot eat, and this nightmare lasts a full year. You're starving. A copepod drifts past your face. You lunge, try to bite. Nothing happens. You're too small. At your size, water behaves like syrup. You can't create suction. The copepod floats away while you snap at nothing. You're surrounded by food, but physics won't let you eat it. You finally catch something by accident. Marine snow, dead plankton, drifts into your mouth. You swallow. Your stomach stops screaming. Then a moon jellyfish sweeps through. Its tentacles span three feet. Your siblings start dying paralyzed, pulled into its mouth, digested alive. You dive below it. The tentacle brushes your tail and burns, but you're sinking into darkness where it can't follow. 200 siblings didn't make it. Skip forward nine months. You're three centimeters long now, the size of a USB stick. You've survived longer than 99% of your siblings, but something's wrong with your body. Your dorsal fin starts itching, then burning. You look back and see it moving. The bones inside are growing, expanding, changing shape. It hurts, like something's pulling your skeleton apart from the inside. Over the next four months, your dorsal fin transforms into something that makes no biological sense. The spines flatten into oval plates. Ridges form. Your entire fin restructures itself into a suction disc on top of your head. But here's the problem. During these four months, you can't use it yet, and you can't swim properly anymore. You're half fish, half something else. You can't do either job right. A yellowfin tuna spots you struggling. You try to swim away, but your changing fin creates drag. You're slower than you've ever been. The tuna closes in, jaws open. You twist hard. The tuna's teeth scrape your side. Miss. You dive into a forest of drifting seaweed and hide. The tuna circles for 10 minutes, then leaves. You're bleeding. Exhausted. More vulnerable than when you were a larva. But the transformation is almost complete. Three more weeks and you'll have your suction disc. Three more weeks and you can finally live the life you were born for. If you survive that long, your disc is finished. Finally. It's two millimeters across an oval sucker on top of your head with 20 parallel ridges that create vacuum seal. Now you need a host. Without one, you'll starve. Your body can't swim long distances, no swim bladder, weak fins, maximum speed of one kilometer per hour. You need to attach to something big that moves through the ocean and carries you. You spot movement near a coral reef, a parrotfish, three feet long, perfect size. You swim toward it. Each stroke exhausts you. You're not built for this. After 10 minutes of swimming, you're close enough. You position yourself above the parrotfish's back. Aim. Drop down. Your disc makes contact. You activate the ridges. They create suction. You're attached. For exactly four seconds. The parrotfish feels you, doesn't like it. Swims straight to the nearest coral head and scrapes its entire body across the rough surface. Your disc rips off. You tumble through the water. Pain explodes across your head. You just lost skin. Blood leaks from your disc's edge. The parrotfish swims away. You're back in open ocean. Alone? Bleeding, exhausted. Skip forward three weeks. You've healed, barely. You're starving again, desperate. You find a manta ray, 20 feet across, huge, too big to scrape you off on anything. But you make a different choice. Instead of attaching to its back, you swim into its gill chamber, inside its mouth, between the gills where water flows constantly. It's dark, tight. Water rushes past you fast, but you wedge yourself in and hold on. Food scraps float past tiny bits of food the manta is eating. You catch them. Finally, real food. For 12 hours, this seems perfect. Then the manta starts spinning. It found a cloud of tiny food in the water. To eat more, it spins in circles underwater, round and round like a washing machine. You slam against the gill wall, hard. The spinning throws you around. You can't hold on. Water pressure crushes you from every side. The manta completes the spin. You shoot out of its mouth like you're being spit across the room, tumbling through the water. Can't control your body. Three of your ribs crack. Your disc tears. You can barely breathe. The manta swims away. It has no idea you almost died. You're desperate now. You'll take anything. You spot a spinner dolphin cruising past. You swim after it with everything you have left. You're getting close, almost there. You position yourself above its belly, ready to attach. A barracuda appears from nowhere, six feet long, mouth full of needle teeth. 
It's not hunting the dolphin, it's hunting you. You freeze. The dolphin keeps swimming, getting farther away. But if you move toward it, the barracuda will catch you. The barracuda's jaw opens. You dart sideways. Its teeth snap shut where you just were. The dolphin is 20 feet away now, swimming away, your only chance. The barracuda turns for another strike. You have no choice. You swim as hard as you can toward the dolphin. The barracuda chases. You're not fast enough. It's gaining. You reach the dolphin. Slam your disc against its belly. Attach. Your disc seals. The barracuda stops, circles. A dolphin is too big to attack. You're safe. For exactly 90 seconds. The dolphin jumps out of the water. Spins three times in the air like a corkscrew. The first spin, you hold on. Your disc grips tight. The second spin, you start sliding. The spinning is throwing you off. The third spin, your disc grips completely free. You're flying through the air. 15 feet above the ocean. Spinning. No idea which way is up. You slam into the water. Feels like hitting concrete. Your disc is bleeding again. Your body is shutting down. The dolphin splashes nearby and swims away. It was just playing. Having fun. It didn't even know you existed. You sink. The barracuda is still down here. Circling. Watching. You wedge yourself between two rocks and don't move for six hours until it leaves. Skip forward two weeks and you find a tiger shark. Ten feet long, swimming steady. And here's the best part. You see two other remoras already stuck to its belly. If they're stuck there, it means this shark doesn't mind passengers. This could work. You swim toward it, getting closer. Almost there. Something grabs your tail. A smaller shark four feet long coming from below. It saw you swimming, thought you were prey. You thrash. Your tail rips. The small shark bites down harder, shaking its head trying to tear you apart. The tiger shark swims past above you, your only chance, getting farther away. You twist your body, bend in a way that shouldn't be possible. Your torn tail screams with pain but you rip free. The small shark has a piece of your tail in its mouth. You're bleeding badly, but you swim up toward the tiger shark with everything you have left. You reach it, attach behind its fin. Your disc seals. You made it. Then something slams into your side. One of the other remoras, way bigger than you, it pushes you backward, away from the good spot, toward the tail. You try to hold your position. The big remora rams you again, harder. You slide backward. The water here is rough, choppy. Your disc barely holds. The shark's tail keeps whipping past, nearly hitting you. Then you slide even farther back, right by the shark's rear end. The smell is awful. The water is terrible. You're getting thrown around. You hold on for three days. Then you can't anymore. Your disc gives up. You let go. Float away behind the shark. Exhausted. Defeated. Your tail is still bleeding from the bite. You've tried four hosts now. None of them worked. You're dying. You know it. You haven't eaten in nine days. Your body is eating its own muscle. You can barely swim anymore. Then you smell something. Blood. Fresh. Close. A great white shark. Fifteen feet long. Swimming alone. No other remoras. No competition. No crowding. This is it. Your last chance. Everything you survived, the jellyfish attacks, the year of starving, the transformation, all the rejections, all the injuries, it all leads here. You swim toward it. Use every bit of energy you have left. Your fins shake. Your disc barely works. Your torn tail drags behind you. You reach the shark. Position yourself behind the left fin. The best spot. Good water flow. Smooth ride. You drop down. Your disc touches the shark's skin. The ridges grab hold. You're attached. The water flows past your gills. You can breathe without working. You feel the smooth ride. Food scraps drift past your mouth. For the first time in 21 months, you feel safe. For exactly four minutes, then something stabs into the shark's side. You don't know what it is. Metal. Sharp. Attached to something. The shark explodes forward, trying to escape. Whatever stabbed it won't let go. You hold on tight. Your disc creates huge pressure. You're not going anywhere. The shark fights for three hours. Thrashing. Diving. Pulling against whatever has it. You feel every violent shake. Every desperate movement but your disc holds. The shark gets tired, slower, weaker. Blood pours from where the metal thing stabbed it. Then you start rising. The shark is being dragged up, toward the surface, toward the light. You break through into air. It burns. Sunlight blinds you. Your skin starts drying immediately. This isn't water. What is this? You look around. The shark is being pulled up higher, out of the water completely. Then you see it, a huge wooden platform, humans standing on it, ropes, metal poles, a boat. The shark lands on the hard surface. You're still stuck to its side. The shark is dying. You feel its heart slowing down. Feel its gills stop moving. Water drains off the boat deck. Your gills are exposed to air. Drying. You can't breathe. Can't get oxygen from air. You try to detach but there's nowhere to go. Just hot wood and metal. No water to swim into. The humans walk around. One looks at the shark. 
doesn't even see you stuck to its side. Your disc starts letting go, not because you want it to, because you're dying. Your muscles are failing. You finally detach, fall onto the hot deck, flopping, gasping. Your gills pull nothing. In seven minutes, you're gone, still on the boat, right next to your dead shark. After surviving 99% of your siblings dying, a full year of starving, a body transformation that nearly killed you, four failed hosts, three major injuries, and a shark bite that tore your tail. You finally found your perfect shark, attached to the ideal spot, felt safe for the first time in your life. And four minutes later, you watched humans drag both of you out of the ocean. You never got to experience the life you spent 21 months suffering to reach. Never got to feel peaceful. Never got to just exist without fighting. After everything, every attack, every rejection, every moment of pain you died on a boat deck, still stuck to the thing you needed to survive. That's why it sucks to be born as a remora. And believe it or not, there's an animal with an even worse life than this. Watch that story next.